we're going to pick a new project today. And that's why I've got some books out. I'm going to take you through a few of the things I thought about. And I do have kind of a book problem. Do we really need to make evening dresses? Because I haven't had much opportunity to make stuff I can actually wear. I did come to something that was kind of a good mix of both. It's something I can wear and something that's got a bit of challenge and ambition in it. This is a velvet coat and it has embroidery of a flower called Sweet Sicily, a sort of arts and crafts era. It's by a department store called Marshall and Snell Grove. So I can imagine just swishing around the house in this. I just love it. So how do you actually begin recreating an actual historical garment? You didn't get to see this in my last project because that was a long time ago when I began. But for this one, well, if you wanted to make a fabulous Victorian velvet coat, you would probably start by looking for a pattern. And true, the first thing we need is a pattern and some materials. But before I do that, I do something else first. In order to pick the right pattern, I'm going to look as hard as I can at what evidence we've got. The pictures I've got of it, the records we've got on the websites. I'm going to try and figure out how this one was made before we can go on to try and make mine. That's not because I'm a stickler for historical accuracy as such. My outcome for this is I love that excited feeling when it starts to come together and it actually looks like the picture. So other people might want to do this differently because you might be more of a designer where you take the picture of the original garment as your inspiration and then use that as a starting point and do something else with it. I would still argue that it's worth gathering whatever evidence you can about the original garment so you know how it was made and how it was done so that you can then use that information to depart from it deliberately. First thing I do is I look for whatever evidence we've got from the museum, who will have looked at this more closely than I have. And here is the record on the Victoria and Albert Museum website. They have got all sorts of information on here. And there's lots of information about just context and why it looks the way it is, why this pattern was probably used. But if we start searching through here, there are always some details of the construction and the materials. So I will take a notepad document and start collecting evidence like this. Oh, here's a list of the materials. Let's put that in. Mm -mm -mm. Embroidered in yellow and green silks in feather stitching couched work and with petals of white felt and applied by means of a French knot in the center. I didn't actually notice until I read this that it was embroidered in yellow and green because when you look very closely at a close-up picture, yes, you can see that the leaves are green and the stalks are yellow and it may be that the flowers are white, but they're a bit faded and discolored over the years. So this is something immediately that I hadn't noticed that's there in the description. So let's take that embroidered in yellow and green silks in feather stitch and couch work. That tells us the stitches as well. So if I didn't know much about embroidery, I could now look up, you know, what is couching? What is a feather stitch? What is a French knot? So that's evidence we can use. Oh, here we go. The coat is full length with a close fitting bodice, flare skirt cut in one piece, leg of mutton sleeves and a rounded stand up collar. The main part of the coat is made up of five panels of velvet, which are joined together by insertions of cream colored machine made lace packed with cream colored silk. The sleeves have similar insertions. So they do, you can see on here. It's starting to point out to me all the basic details that I may or may not have noticed. The coat is lined Ah, now we're getting into details on the inside, which I can't see on the pictures, with cream coloured silk. And there's an inner lining of a woolen gauze like fabric. Is it there for warmth? Is it there to stabilise the velvet? I don't know. It could be to support the embroidery. 
The collar is lined with canvas and stiffened with wires, useful too. So we can take all of this. The coat fastens down the front with hooks and eyes. One of the sleeves has a trimming of machine made lace. We'll figure that out later. But this is all evidence we can copy and paste in there. So here's an interesting thing. Intact panel of silk, including selvages width 53.5 centimeters. Now that is very interesting. Well, intact panel of silk, that indicates the lining. We've got a piece of silk in the lining where both of the selvages are still on that piece of fabric. So we can tell how wide the fabric was that it was made from. That reminds me that in this era, fabric was made in a lot narrower widths in general. So nowadays you get fabric that's either 45 or 60 inches wide, generally speaking, and that's very wide compared to back then. It was more like 21, 22 inches back then. That is interesting to know because that means that none of these pieces of velvet can be wider than about 22 inches. So that's a good thing to keep in mind when I'm trying to figure out the pattern. This is a wide big coat, but none of the individual panels are gonna be wider than around about 22 inches. So we're just gathering all this evidence. You're gonna find out now, one of the reasons I picked this coat is because it's been featured on the new Google Arts and Culture website. And there are these huge, huge photographs, what they call gigapixel images. So multiple very high resolution images have been taken and knitted together. So you end up with one enormous, super high resolution picture, which you can zoom right into and see a very fine detail. I've got a picture of the front, which isn't on the VNA website, they've just got pictures of the back. So we can actually zoom right in here, for example, and see the collar. And we can see this white silk lining that we heard about. We can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six pieces in the collar because we're close enough to see the seams, which is very useful. And we'll get more into looking at seams in a minute. But we also find lots of interesting stuff to find out and that's fun to see. I'll put the link in the description below. Do we have any more evidence here? Oh, look, so we do. We've got some more measurements, which are always very interesting. 59 inches center back from the back of the neck down to the hem, which makes sense, it was full length. Width 108 inches in the hem. That is gonna be really interesting to know when we are making our pattern, because otherwise we're just looking at a picture and guessing. To have that exact measurements, that it's 108 inches around the hem, is gonna be really helpful in getting that looking right. Or if I wanted to depart from it, if I wanted to be a bit bigger and a bit smaller, I know what this one is to compare to what I want. So we're gathering everything we can there. Let's go in and look very closely one more time at this coat. Because here's something I noticed at the top of the sleeve. You can just about see a line here. That looks like a seam, but you wouldn't have a sleeve seam there. And then it seems to stop. It disappears by about here. So it looks like there's a great big dart right there. And it turned out from looking very closely at this, there are darts in the front of the sleeve and then the back is gathered. So again, another piece of interesting evidence. When we come to picking a pattern, I'm gonna to want to know, is it a two piece sleeve or a one piece sleeve? And I've been able to find on this picture, if we look very closely, come all the way down to the cuff, there is a seam going up the back of the cuff. Now, if it was a one piece sleeve with one pattern piece, the seam would be underneath, but that seam is down the back, which means that there are two pieces. And if we look at the picture of the back, is there a seam on the back as well, which would confirm that it's a two piece sleeve. And look, there it is. So we can tell all sorts of things by just looking very, very closely at the pictures. And later on, these are gonna be really useful for drawing out the pattern for the embroidery. One thing that confused me 
as I was looking at these details, is that piece that I took off the v &A website said it's supposedly made of five full length panels of velvet. Front, front, a side, a side, and a back. And that's easy to see from looking at the pictures. But wait a minute, a coat like this usually has a centre back seam that should be two pieces of velvet down the back. So does it have a centre back seam? When I zoom right in again, up, oh, there's my centre back seam. Let's see if I can find it at the top as well. Yep, there it is. Here's the collar. I can see my centre back seam. And I can see how the shoulder seam is a little way dropped back as it would have been at the time. I can see how all of this fullness at the back has been gathered in, but at the top there is again this little funny little dart and another one there. From all of that evidence, I collect all that up and I have other questions that all of that brings up. So on my document I've got, were the sleeves originally puffier looking or have they dropped a little bit? I don't know yet. It's something to keep in mind. And then it occurs to me also when we've done our live workshops at Foundations Revealed, I know I've heard Luca, our mentor, talk about velvets and how they were made back in the day and how they're very different from how they are now. Because I'm starting to think, how am I going to embroider on all this velvet? How's that going to work? Because when you buy silk velvet today, this is a little remnant of silk velvet I've got lying around. It's very, very drapey, very, very drapey and very difficult to work with. It slides around like you wouldn't believe when you're trying to sew it because it's so flimsy. And I looked up and found, sure enough, according to Luca, these kinds of silk velvets really were designed to make 20s and 30s floaty bias dresses. They're not really meant for something like this. Velvets back in the day, back in the 19th century, would have been much more sturdy. And long story short, it involves iron-on interfacing to stabilise it. I am going to be taking very large pieces of velvet and ironing on some interfacing. And he showed us how to do it. He and our concierge Mary showed us how. So there are going to be adventures to come involving velvet and ironing on interfacing, which is going to be entertaining for you. So as I looked at those very close-up pictures, I was trying to find out as much as I could. And in the end, I have then gone with all of the evidence I have to my pattern drafting books. I have three books of about the right era. The museum record says that this coat would have been made sometime 1895 to 1900. So I have got a drafting book from 1895, one from 1897, one from 1901. Again, this is because I've been doing it for 30 years and collecting the books. This is not something you desperately need. When I first started out, I would take modern patterns, just your average big four patterns, and mess with them until I had about the shape I wanted. And you can certainly do that. Also, many of these books, like this one, is available on archive.org for free. So. Don't feel like you have to have vast numbers of books. Let's start looking for a pattern. So what I'm trying to do here by gathering all that evidence is really I'm trying to reduce the number of decisions I have to make. If I've got a lot of little details, then I can narrow down things like how many patterns I have to choose from. There are lots of patterns between these books. So to take the first book we've got, this is my 1895 Keystone Guide. Here I found yeah, long coat patterns. I've got a nice two-piece sleeve here. And this is compared to the basic sleeve. We need something a bit fuller because looking at the picture, we need something just a little bit of a puff sleeve. But we don't need something as big as a traditional leg of mutton sleeve, which if you look at the fashions of the time, like the one on the cover of the book, you know, this leg of mutton sleeve was a huge sort of bulbous thing. And that doesn't look like what we've got on this coat. So we don't need one as big as that. So I'm going to come down to something like this. Again, here is a possible pattern for the coat. 
Although we've got too many pieces, I need a back, a side and a front. I guess we could take that seam out possibly, but also I'm not too sure about this one because the curve of this side back seam is a bit too curved compared to the original picture. There's that seam in the original one, it's actually quite straight with that insert of white fabric in between. So that's a kind of, yeah, maybe. So let's move on to 1897. This is the late Victorian women's tailoring, the direct system of ladies cutting. I will put it in the notes below. And here, oh, we've got some looser fitting jackets here in 1897. That might be useful. We've got, oh, very nice two piece sleeve, which is not as big as that big leg of mutton thing, but a bit more like what our coat looks like. We've got, oh, look, we've got a coat that's almost three pieces, not quite, that's more of a dart, but it gives you some idea. Comparing it to the original coat, this seam is too far down. We want that to be further up here, but you know, we're getting there. And then this one, this was the first one actually that I found flicking through this. This is a three piece dressing gown. That one might be very useful actually. That one might be a winner because the shape of this coat is looser and more dressing gown like. So that may be a useful one. The problem with this book is that there aren't that many actual drafting instructions. There's not that much detail on how to do it. But we have got some ideas of shapes. So, you know, some useful stuff there. And then here, 1901, we're getting a tiny bit late now in 1901, but I'm not imagining that much in here would be brand new and never seen before in 1901. So it would be vastly different. And maybe the sleeves here are a little bit different and this looks a little bit higher, but we have got a sleeve pattern here that has darts in the top. So that might help me with drafting some little darts in the top of this sleeve. And also we've got another coat here with that side back seam in just about the right place actually. And it's not so curved, it's a bit straighter. So I may use a version of that. I found a collar pattern too. Here are a ton of collar patterns and this one looks rather useful. I think that one is our candidate for our big stand-up collar. Although there are only four pieces here, but we can use this principle to make one with six pieces to make it just like that one. So I think we're getting there. I think we've got an idea of the kind of pattern we need for the coat, the body of the coat itself, and then a two piece sleeve that's puffed, but not too puffed. And then that big round collar. Those are the three major pieces. And then of course those white inserts will just be triangles. So I will now go on to figure out a bit of the maths of this and how big these pieces need to be. Because when I look at these coat patterns, I'm comparing the hem now and 1895, 1897, 1901. I'm looking at the width of the pieces at the hem because we've got a coat here with a fairly narrow back piece compared to the side piece. And then the front piece is quite wide but none of them can be wider than 22 inches. At the same time, we also know the complete hem is 106 inches. So we've got a few figures to play with. If the whole hem is 106 and each piece of velvet can't be wider than 22, and we can tell from looking at the pictures roughly how each of those pieces relates to each other in terms of which one is wider and which one is narrower, then we can probably start to guess how wide those white triangular inserts are and we can start getting a bit closer to a pattern. But you can see now how I'm not just stabbing in the dark for a pattern now, I am looking at what evidence we have and using that to narrow down my decisions and make my decision making easier. So I am gonna organize all of those thoughts and then I think it will be time to draft a pattern.